made the only decision I ever knew how to make. I did what I thought was right. Fifty years ago, the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. To this day, Americans know very little about how that decision was reached. It's been justified ever since as something that saved American lives. The ambiguity is something we're really not prepared for. Tonight, a week before the bomb's anniversary, why it was dropped. Did it shorten the war? Did it save American lives? Was it necessary? Were there alternatives? Did the United States need to be the first and only nation to use an atomic bomb? Do Americans know the truth about the decision to drop the atomic bomb? Americans know very little about why the bomb was used. Peter Jennings reporting. Hiroshima, why the bomb was dropped. Two years ago, America's premier history museum, the Smithsonian, set out to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the flight of the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. We want to present as best we can multiple views of that history, not a singular view of uh, one or another or a third party. From the beginning, the proposal for the exhibit was under attack. Too many pictures of victims, the critics said. Too much American guilt. I, I can't believe that they would create such an abomination. By the spring of 1994, some veterans groups had declared virtual war on the museum, saying the exhibit portrayed Americans as vengeful aggressors and the Japanese as innocent victims. It's certainly un-American that might be close to treason. The Smithsonian tried to incorporate the veterans' views, but the American Legion vowed to resist anything that questioned the moral and political wisdom involved in dropping the atomic bomb. The curators wrote a political statement, an anti-nuclear, anti-atomic political statement. Finally, the exhibit collapsed over a hypothetical question. How many American lives did the bomb really save? There are literally millions of Americans who would not be here today if those weapons had not been used. Many veterans insisted that by dropping the bomb, the U.S. avoided a ground invasion of the Japanese mainland. One million American lives, they argued, had been saved. But when the Smithsonian responded that such a claim had no historical basis, the vets went to Capitol Hill. Eighty-one congressmen took up their cause. So after a bruising two-year battle, the Smithsonian bent to the pressure and decided to present just the Alona Gay without commentary. There would be nothing on the decision to drop the bomb, and there would be no pictures of the victims. Good evening. I'm Peter Jennings. Tonight, we're going to revisit the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. We're going to go behind the scenes of the Truman administration 50 years ago, as America struggled to finally end the bloody war in the Pacific. The site of the Enola Gay, newly refurbished and on exhibition here at the Smithsonian, is a shiny reminder that in the closing days of World War II, the United States, in its determination to end the war, became the first and only nation ever to use the atomic bomb. It was a subject of controversy then, as it is now. Hiroshima, why the bomb was dropped. Peter Jennings reporting. Ladies and gentlemen, the 33rd President of the United States, Harry S. Truman. In 1964, Harry Truman would cooperate with a television series that laid out the official well, history of his presidency. Good to see you here this morning for a discussion, I hope, of uh, some historical matters in which you ought to be interested. My goodness alive, young lady with the red hair right behind the school teacher there. Mr. President, why did you drop the atom bomb? Mr. President, the future wants to know, was it right to drop the atom bomb? My chief purpose was to end the war in victory with the least possible loss of American lives. I never had any qualms about using an instrument that finally ended the war in which we either had 250 or 300,000 of our youngsters killed and 700,000 of them remained. I made the only decision 
I ever knew how to make. I did what I thought was right. The official history of the atomic bomb was also reflected from movie screens. In fact, Hollywood's first attempt at an A-bomb blockbuster was not released until it had White House approval. In the original script, the actor playing President Truman made what seemed a quick and easy decision. It was American boys or the bomb. But the president's advisors who previewed the film were concerned yes. about his image. And the president himself wrote to the man who portrayed him. My only objection is it appeared to have been a snap judgment program. It was made to appear as if no consideration had been given to the result of dropping the bomb. That is an absolutely wrong impression. Thank God we've got the bomb and not the Japanese. What movie audiences finally saw was an agonized decision. That's one argument for our using it, Charlie, but it's not the decisive argument. The whole thing is terrifying. You must have spent many sleepless nights over it. A year less of war, Charlie, will mean life for 300,000, maybe a half a million, of America's finest youth. These were the decisive considerations in my consent. As President of the United States, sir, you could make no other decision. As President, I could not. In the film, there are many factual mistakes. The Enola Gay takes off on its historic mission and then braves heavy flak over Hiroshima. On August the 6th, 1945, there was no hostile fire. 250,000 people down there starting the day. A city about the size of Dallas, Texas. In about one second, they'll be wiped off the map. They'll never know what hit them. We've been dropping warning leaflets on them for 10 days now. That's 10 days more warning than they gave us at Pearl Harbor. In fact, no leaflets were dropped specifically warning the city below of a powerful new bomb. The film won the Academy Award for its special effects, and Hollywood had done its part to tell the official story that the use of the bomb on enemy cities had been necessary and just. This was a war fought against evil, against military dictatorships in Germany, Italy, and Japan. This was a war the United States did not seek, but after Pearl Harbor fought with a unity of purpose it has not experienced since. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. It was Franklin Roosevelt who authorized a project hidden deep in the New Mexico desert to build the atomic bomb. It was the president's most closely guarded secret. The scientists drawn to Los Alamos had come believing they could help save Western civilization from fascism by beating the Germans to the bomb. Their mission was to make a weapon like no other. It was codenamed the Manhattan Project. Robert Oppenheimer was its scientific leader. Its military director was Army General Leslie Groves. By 1945, the Manhattan Project employed 160,000 workers at 37 factories and labs across the country. General Groves promised the first atomic test by the middle of the year. President Roosevelt would not live to see it. April the 12th, 1945. The death of the Commander-in-Chief three and a half years after Pearl Harbor stunned a nation that had come to depend on it. The people's fear would be reflected in the words of Roosevelt's Chief of Staff, Admiral William Leahy. The captain of the team is gone. We are all at loose ends and confused as to who may be capable of giving sage advice and counsel to the new leader. They were shocked. Harry Truman, from their point of view, was an insignificant figure. Perhaps almost anyone compared to Roosevelt would have been insignificant, but Truman was 
on the long list of insignificant figures, perhaps the most insignificant they could imagine. They had no respect for him, they had no confidence in him. Colonel Henry Stimson was Roosevelt's Secretary of War. I think every one of us felt very keenly the loss of a real personal friend. I know I did. No one knows what the new president's views are. At least I don't. There's a note in the Stimson Diaries of about a year or a year and a half before uh, Truman became president uh, in which Stimson noted after a conversation with Truman that Truman is a pretty untrustworthy man. But Stimson felt it was his obligation to educate Truman, especially about the atomic bomb, which was at that point Stimson's most important responsibility. Harry Truman had been vice president for 82 days. In that time, he had met with Franklin Roosevelt only twice. He knew nothing of the atomic bomb. Stimson went up to the president, the new president, and said, we are involved in making a most terrible weapon. Within four months, we shall in all probability have completed the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. One bomb of which could destroy a whole city. The world in its present state of moral advance would be eventually at the mercy of such a weapon. In other words, modern civilization might be completely destroyed. When Stimson and Groves first briefed him in detail about the bomb in April of 1945, he kind of thumbed through the paper and, and he wasn't terribly interested in what they had to say. I mean, he caught the gist of what they were, were trying to say, which was this is the most terrible weapon in history and it can take out a whole city. So he knew that, but how that translated into his, his actions or how that translated into his thinking about the bomb is, is, is much less clear. There was Truman, who did not have all those bright young men around him as Franklin Roosevelt had, by his own account, had received absolutely no preparation for ascending the presidency, nor had been privy to the development of the atomic bomb and immediately looked to who is the most experienced man politically and in terms of diplomacy that I can trust, someone like me. That man who would have so much influence on Harry Truman was James Burns of South Carolina. Burns had believed that he would be Roosevelt's vice president until Roosevelt picked Truman at the convention. So Burns would join President Truman's circle as the man who thought he should have the job. He was one of the few men who'd known anything about the bomb and had warned Roosevelt that the huge amounts of money being spent meant political scandal if it were not a success. He knew more than Truman, and Truman knew that Jimmy Burns could make certain that the atomic project would show results both militarily and politically. Uh, so Burns took a slight knowledge, which he had, as his leverage uh, to present himself as Mr. Atomic Bomb to Harry. So there was Truman, with a shrewd, calculating Southern politician on one side, and on the other, the more cautious, conservative Colonel Stimson. Burns had already told me that the weapon might be so powerful as to be potentially capable of wiping out entire cities and killing people on an unprecedented scale. Might well put us in a position to dictate our terms at the end of the war. Stimson, on the other hand, seemed at least as much concerned with the role of the atomic bomb in the shaping of history as in its capacity to shorten this war. President Truman described the pressure to use the bomb. General Groves was the military man in charge of the whole bomb building project. He wrote, and I quote, Truman was like a little boy on a toboggan. He never had an opportunity to say, we will drop that bomb. Any political leader would have been crucified later if American lives were lost in the invading Japan. Well, I wasn't worried about being crucified. When Harry Truman became president, Germany was close to surrender, but the war in the Pacific was still to be won. Against an enemy, Americans had come to hate even more than the Germans. The Japanese behavior was appalling and atrocious. 
toward Chinese, toward civilians, toward peoples throughout Asia, toward prisoners of war. It's very clear that in Germany there were good Germans and bad Germans, and almost always the Americans described themselves as fighting Hitler or Nazis. In the case of the Japanese, you get all sorts of slogans like the only good Jap is a dead Jap. Less than two weeks before Truman became president, on Easter Sunday, 1945, the U.S. 10th Army landed on the Japanese island of Okinawa. It would be the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. A Marine who survived wrote it this way. The struggle for survival went on day after weary day. To those who entered the meat grinder itself, the war was a netherworld of horror from which escape seemed less and less likely. As casualties mounted and the fighting dragged on and on, time had no meaning. Life had no meaning. Many people who argued that the atomic bomb was necessary remember Okinawa, an enemy hidden in caves who would not surrender even when faced with certain death. I didn't think twice whether civilians or soldiers were inside. Any remorse about human beings shot in there disappeared pretty quick because this was survival. I wanted to live. I wanted to go home. But the story on Okinawa was not the story of the whole war. In the summer of 1945, what sort of shape was Japan in militarily? Japan militarily was in tatters. The Air Force had been virtually destroyed. The Navy had been shattered. The Army had been repatriated for the last homeland defense. Japan was clearly near defeat. The question is, was Japan near surrender? Surrender was the question. It would turn on the U.S. demand that surrender be total total with no conditions, and the Japanese fear that the imperial throne would not be allowed to survive. The emperor to them was like a god, and they worshipped him. So in a sense, he personified their nation, and uh, until he gave a signal that it was all right to surrender, they were ready to fight to the death. Japan's own policy, led by the military forces and supported by the Emperor of Japan was to show the Americans how terribly costly it would be if they tried to push the war to an invasion or to unconditional surrender. The last year of the war was the killing year and neither side can seem to break out of this before a final cataclysmic end. In this killing year, Japan's suicide pilots were promised glory in death, sent off in aircraft laden with bombs and only enough fuel for a one-way trip. A 19-year-old pilot would write this on the eve of a mission. To bring the nation to victory was our thought. And what was that nation? The land of my parents, younger brothers, and sister. Can we bear seeing our country invaded by outside enemies? That was on my mind. We were innocents. The Japanese kamikaze missions would strike a chord of terror in the American psyche and convince American troops that the enemy would fight to the bitter end. summer, America was watching too many of its young men die. killing year, the United States would play its part as well. Through the night of March 9, 1945, while Roosevelt was still president, 334 American B-29s 
firebombed Tokyo. Almost 17 square miles were destroyed. 80,000 Japanese were killed. The Air Force General in charge of the firebombing, General Curtis LeMay, said the United States had finally stopped swatting at flies and gone after the manure pile. They've gotten gradually used to a war where the normal limits on killing non-combatants has been overridden by many sides in the world. The Japanese use of gas warfare in, in China. Think of the number of civilians who die in Russia because of the German invasion. Think of the people in the concentration camps who are dying, all non-combatants. The war for total victory had become total war. So that moral threshold of killing civilians deliberately in mass terror bombing has already been crossed in the Roosevelt administration. That's not something that, that Harry Truman is going to roll back or to rescind. Neither would President Truman interfere with the atomic bomb program Roosevelt had set in motion. Scientists on the Manhattan Project raced to develop not just one bomb, but two. The simpler would use a rare form of uranium. The more complicated would use plutonium. Either, they knew, would be a terrible force. The man in charge, General Leslie Groves, thought it his duty to make sure the terrible force was used. He had a blank check to do what it took to get the bomb ready. Then, the assumption was, it would be dropped. The thing that's peculiar about the bomb was there was no procedure for deciding, except that ultimately the president would have to say yes or no um, uh, to something. But, but who would be involved in whatever was sort of made up as it went along. As he relentlessly pushed the scientists, General Groves also pushed to appoint a target committee of military officers to choose the places the bomb should be dropped. It was not their job to decide whether the bomb should be used, only where and how. And Groves' concern is to preserve some targets untouched in Japan, some cities untouched, so that he could demonstrate precisely the impact of the bomb on a city. Their problem wasn't picking targets, it was the fear they would run out of them. It's really perverse, but they had to put four cities off limits from conventional bombing in order to be able to drop an A-bomb on them and see what would happen. The official history has always taught that the atomic bombs were directed at military targets. But this was General Groves' first choice. Kyoto, Japan's ancient and sacred capital. Surrounded by mountains, Kyoto had the perfect terrain to concentrate the bomb's impact. And as the target committee minutes make clear, Kyoto was not listed for military reasons. It was agreed that psychological factors in target selection were of great importance. Two aspects of this are, one, obtaining the greatest psychological effect against Japan, and two, making the initial use sufficiently spectacular for the importance of the weapon to be internationally recognized when publicity is released. In this respect, Kyoto has the advantage of the people being more highly intelligent, and hence better able to appreciate the significance of the weapon. When you actually look at the target choices, the aim points are never military installations. They are, in fact, the center of the geographic center points of cities. Yes, in every city, there are some things that are militarily related. There are factories or whatever. But the target is the city, and the aim point is the center of the city. At these highest levels of decision making, did anybody ever object to the targeting of civilians? Basically, only one person objected directly before Hiroshima, and that was ironically General George C. Marshall, the Army Chief of Staff, who on May 29, 1945, with Stimson, argued that if America dropped the bomb on a city, the opprobrium or the, the blame cast upon the United States 
might last and destroy the American image. Marshall never raised the issue again, so far as we know, during World War II, and after World War II, never admitted that he'd raised the question. It was the target committee that also put Hiroshima on the list. Hiroshima is the largest untouched target not on the 21st Bomber Command priority list. Consideration should be given to this city. Hiroshima, a coastal city on the southern tip of Japan's main island. There was an army headquarters here, home to 43,000 soldiers. The city itself had a population of almost 300,000. The army base was not the center of the target. Ground Zero was the center of the city. By 1944, a special unit was practicing bomb drops from a remote secret air base near Wendover, Utah. President Truman described it in his television history. To get ready for the delivery of the bomb, the 509th Composite Group of the 20th Air Force had been practicing for over a year in an isolated desert of Wendover Field. But they didn't know what they were training for. They were making visual, not instrumental drops. And they were practicing to drop only one bomb, which to them was funnier still. The secret development of a terrible weapon during a war fought for total victory had created a powerful impulse to use it. Only the scientists seemed to understand it would change the world forever. On the eve of its success, some of them felt increasingly trapped between their ominous invention and the political leaders who would determine its use. They wanted to, if you will, play fair with the Japanese and warn them, not kill civilians, if the weapon itself would scare them into surrender. Uh, I think more importantly, they wanted to uh, keep from surprising the Russians. They felt that the more of a surprise it was, the more damage it did, uh, the, uh, the more awesome the, uh, the weapon appeared to be, uh, the more likely it was to lead to a nuclear, a, a nuclear arms race. It would, by, its very, the, by the nature of its effectiveness, uh, drive the Soviets to, uh, uh, to get it as quickly as possible. The most outspoken of the scientists was Leo Szilard, a Hungarian emigre who, along with Albert Einstein, had written the letter that convinced Roosevelt to build the bomb in the first place. In 1945, Szilard was again looking to the future. He set out on a mission to save civilization, not from the Nazis this time, but from the bomb. He was determined to meet the president. He and two colleagues were told instead to travel to Spartanburg, South Carolina, to meet Mr. Atomic Bomb, James Burns, they had no idea who he was. This would be virtually the only meeting in the spring of 1945 where someone argued against dropping the bomb. And they sat down with Burns to try to tell him about the need to have international control of this weapon, to tell the Russians ahead of time so they're not surprised, not scared. And he was talking to just the wrong man. Burns had seen the advances the Russians were making in Europe, and he wanted to impress the Russians with Americans' firmness and with the fact that this was going to be a shared peace. And so to him, the bomb was just the thing he was waiting for. I was completely flabbergasted at the assumption that rattling the bomb might make Russia more manageable. I was concerned at this point that by demonstrating the bomb and using it in the war against Japan, we might start an atomic arms race between America and Russia, which might end with the destruction of both countries. The physicists were to Jimmy Barron's political naives. They'd never stood for an election. Oh, they would never have to face the mother of the, uh, the textile worker who had been killed in Okinawa and did not think in terms as Burns thought, which Burns and Burns thought almost exclusively in political terms. Now one could ask, you know, what point did politics have in this meeting? And I think that Burns would have replied everything. Burns went on to dominate the uh, debate within the federal government. And having met with somebody like Szilard, 
He decided, in fact, that his views were true. He could dismiss these people as being crackpots, as being somehow preoccupied with something that didn't matter. And so it probably gave Burns an assurance to carry forward uh, just the policies that Szilard feared he would carry forward. I was rarely as depressed as when we left Burns' house and walked toward the station. I thought to myself, how much better all the world might be had I been born in America and become influential in American politics, and had Burns been born in Hungary and studied physics. Zillard would not give up. In the weeks before the bomb was dropped, he would enlist the support of 68 other atomic scientists, urging the president to reconsider its use. President Truman never saw their petition. Months and years later, when he appeared in public, he would make light of this by saying, the public is fascinated by mass murderers, and I'm a mass murderer. He said this in his ironic and almost uncontrollable way of making light of things that bothered him deeply, but I think he did see himself for the rest of his life as a mass murderer. Two days after Zillard left Spartanburg, James Burns returned to Washington, where he had been made a member of a secret committee appointed by War Secretary Stimson. The committee included the inner circle of government and establishment leaders who had recommended the bomb to Roosevelt. Truman, even before Burns surfaced as his Secretary of State, secretly made Burns his personal representative to this top secret, a committee, uh, advisory committee called the Interim Committee. It's a powerful indication of Truman's delegation of these kinds of crucial responsibilities uh, to Burns. James Burns, whom the president had decided to name his Secretary of State, would become a potent force. Meeting in the Pentagon on the 31st of May, the committee's official agenda was nuclear policy after the war. Colonel Stimson went into the meeting worried about how the Russians would react to the bomb. Army Chief General Marshall suggested Russian scientists be invited to the first test. Burns cut them off. The Russians would not be let in on the atomic secret. Stimson backed down. I think a younger Stimson might have pushed a lot harder. But remember, what you have here is a jockeying for a relationship with the president. It will not be the last time that President Truman bends to the will of James Burns. Burns always, always looked at Truman as a junior partner. I think that he had a, a kind of contemptuous attitude toward Truman. And I think that, that he did see himself as the instructor and Truman as a pupil. He was overwhelmed with running Congress. He was trying to find his way around the White House. He had people who had been doing this job for years in the form of the very dominant Secretary of War, the very dominant General Groves. He brought in the most dominant person he knew in diplomacy, which was James Burns. So he was really letting these people run the show. The President of the United States is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces. The Chiefs of Staff had to make the plan for the invasion of Japan without considering the atomic bomb. It was estimated that to land on Kyushu and conquer it would cost 250,000 of our youngsters in be, uh, to be killed and 500,000 of them to be maimed for life. The projected casualty numbers that President Truman would use later in life would range from 250,000 to a million. That notion of putting a million lives at risk long ago became a central part of the argument for using the bomb. Though the figure of a million has never been found in any of the briefings President Truman received from his military commanders. The real debate in the summer of 1945 was not whether an invasion would be a tragedy. It would have been. But there was no plan to invade for another several months. The real question was how to end the war without that bloody fight to the finish. There was a military option. There was a diplomatic one. And there was the bomb. The military option was to wait for the Russians to get into the war. In a secret agreement, the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin had promised Roosevelt that three months after the end of the European campaign, his Red Army would move against the Japanese occupying China. As early as April, U.S. military intelligence concluded that a Russian invasion could be decisive. 
By the autumn of 1945, we believe that the vast majority of Japanese will realize the inevitability of absolute defeat, regardless of whether the USSR has actually entered the war against Japan. If at any time the USSR should enter the war, all Japanese will realize that absolute defeat is inevitable. The Americans had also broken Japanese military and diplomatic codes. Reading the secret diplomatic intercepts known as magic, the United States knew that Japan itself understood what Russia's entry into the war would mean to them. In the spring of 1945, the Japanese foreign minister cabled his ambassador in Moscow. It is a matter of utmost urgency that we should not only prevent Russia from entering the war, but should also induce her to adopt a favorable attitude toward Japan. The Japanese ambassador in Moscow cabled back to Tokyo that there was not much reason to be encouraged. It is hard to say whether the present eastward movement of troops is being carried out for the purpose of bringing pressure against Japan. We must be on our guard as soon as we notice any marked movement of troops towards eastern Siberia. The increasingly urgent messages ask the Russians to help negotiate a surrender. Stalin ignores them. Unfortunately, it now appears that we shall soon have to abandon our struggle on Okinawa. If Russia, by some remote chance, should suddenly decide to take advantage of our weakness and intervene against us with the force of arms, we should be in a completely hopeless situation. Seventy-five thousand Japanese had died on Okinawa. Thirteen thousand Americans had been killed. As the Japanese war widows were presented with the ashes of their husbands, in Washington there were some people looking for a political way to end the war. There were three things that were known in the government in Washington that were not known before the first bomb was dropped to the Japanese. One was the bomb itself. One was that the Russians are coming. And the third was that under terms and conditions to be agreed, the Japanese could keep the emperor. That was the political option. Let the Japanese keep their emperor. And President Truman knew that everyone in the bitterly divided Japanese government would insist on it. Policymakers who were advising Truman, those who were closest to Truman and, and for whom he had a great deal of respect, were saying, look, Mr. President, one way we can end the war as rapidly as possible is to modify our demand for, un for unconditional surrender. Our intelligence people, to a man, said, look, if you harm the god, they will fight forever. You must tell them that you're not going to do that. Say that he can be like the King of England, we won't harm him, we won't have any power, but in some way make it very clear that that will not be the case, that they will not, he will not be harmed. Lost in today's debate is the fact that military men were among the key voices urging a change in surrender terms. Admiral William Leahy, the senior military man in the White House who called the bomb that fool thing, argued there were military reasons for a negotiated peace. Admiral Leahy said that he could not agree with those who said to him that unless we obtain the unconditional surrender of the Japanese, that we will have lost the war. What he did fear was that our insistence on unconditional surrender would result only in making the Japanese desperate and thereby increasing our casualty lists. There were alternatives. And Truman and Stimson and Burns and the others were fully conscious of those alternatives. One was to wait for the Soviets to come into the war. One was to modify unconditional surrender. Another alternative was to use the atomic bomb. The bomb had its strong advocates, many of the members of the secret interim committee. The official history points to these men as the ones who carefully considered whether the bomb was necessary. But the evidence shows that the central question of using the bomb was raised only by accident. When this committee breaks for lunch, there's a discussion at one of the tables about alternatives to using the bomb directly on a city. Now, this discussion takes place because uh, the decision is simply accepted that that's 
what's going to happen. And there are a few of the committee members, uh, including some of the scientists, saying, gee, do we really have to do it that way? Is it possible to do it uh, some other way? Robert Oppenheimer, the scientific leader of the Manhattan Project, remembered that sometime during the lunch, Colonel Stimson emphasized the appalling lack of conscience and compassion that the war had brought about. He was not exultant about the bombings of Hamburg or Dresden or Tokyo. Colonel Stimson felt that, as far as degradation went, we had had it. That it would take a new life and a new breath to heal the harm. But the idea of demonstrating the bomb was vetoed. The idea of warning the Japanese was dismissed. At the time, did Colonel Stimson have any doubts about Not using about using it, no. Using it against the city, if you'd pushed him, he would have said, well, we fought that battle, we lost it. The next day, James Burns moved to settle the question that had been raised by accident and pushed for a formal vote. The present view of the committee was that the bomb should be used against Japan as soon as possible, that it should be used on a war plant surrounded by workers' homes, and that it should be used without prior warning. It's, it's one of the myths that's persisted since the war, isn't it, that the atomic bomb was dropped on a military target. In fact, well, it was not a myth. It's a military target. It's a military target like New York. If there was a day when the bomb decision was sealed and delivered, it would be the 1st of June, when James Burns went to the White House to tell the president what the committee had approved. But Burns was covering his bases here. As the president's personal representative on the committee, Burns was doing the job that he had been chosen to do, which is covering the president. Nothing, from a political point of view, is so advantageous as a committee of shared responsibility. Mr. President, here it is in writing, from the most experienced public men within this nation, from the best scientific minds, you are making the right decision. Do it. Do it quickly, and do it with no warning. How the bomb would be used had now been confirmed. Five days later, the aging Secretary of War met with the President. Colonel Stimson's diary of their conversation reflects his own agony and confusion about attacking cities. I told him I was busy considering our conduct of the war against Japan and how I was trying to hold the Air Force to precision bombing. First, because I did not want to have the U.S. get the reputation of outdoing Hitler in atrocities. And second, I was a little fearful that before we could get ready, the Air Force might have Japan so thoroughly bombed out that the weapon would not have a fair background to show its strength. He laughed and said he understood. In early July, Colonel Stimson made one last effort to convince the president that the war might end if the Japanese were offered a chance to surrender. He writes in his memoirs, it's possible in the light of the final surrender that a clearer and earlier exposition of American willingness to retain the emperor would have produced an earlier ending. But he did what to he could war. on that issue. He pushed as hard as he knew how. Right. He didn't. He had no regrets on that. Only on this question did he later believe that history might find that the United States, by its delay in stating its position on the emperor, had prolonged the war. That's right. He did think that that was possible. That you'd reach that conclusion, and it may be. I think that is an open question. On the 6th of July, the president set sail aboard the USS Augusta on his way to a summit meeting in Berlin with Joseph Stalin and British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. American troops had just fought to a very bloody victory on Okinawa. At the top of the president's agenda was ensuring that Stalin would keep his promise to President Roosevelt and send the Red Army to war against Japan within a month. In his pocket, the president carried the draft ultimatum given to him by Stimson, making it clear that the emperor could keep his throne if Japan surrendered. But at his side was his newly sworn in secretary of state, and James Burns argued that the president would be crucified politically if he made a deal.
with the Japanese. I had to make a decision as to whether we'd use that bomb on Japan or not. And that decision was up to me because I was the President of the United States and we controlled the bomb. In July of 1945, the President could still have said no. He could have done so during the Allied meeting in Potsdam, the suburb of Berlin, where he would first meet both Winston Churchill and Joseph Stalin. Truman privately compared Stalin to the boss of the Missouri political machine from which he had come and nicknamed him Uncle Joe. Stalin privately called Truman that noisy little shopkeeper. The Allied leaders knew they had to deal with one another in the world after the war. Truman had postponed their meeting until he was pretty sure he had the bomb. In the New Mexico desert, the gadget, as the device to be tested was called, had been moved to ground zero. General Groves was pushing hard to test the plutonium bomb. If it worked, the United States could produce half a dozen or more, creating a nuclear arsenal and giving President Truman enormous power in his dealings at Potsdam. At Potsdam, the president writes in his diary about his first meeting with Stalin. We had lunch, talked socially, put on a real show drinking toast to everyone, then pictures made in the backyard. I can deal with Stalin. He is honest, but smart as hell. Most of the big points are settled. He'll be in the Jap war on August 15th. Finny Japs when that comes about. At this moment in Potsdam, before the bomb is a reality, the president seems to understand that he does have an important alternative to an American invasion of Japan. The Red Army's entry into the war might be the way to end it. He rejoices about the Russians in a letter to his wife. I've gotten what I came for. Stalin goes to war August 15th with no strings on it. I'll say that we'll end the war a year sooner now and think of the kids who won't be killed. That is the important thing. At the New Mexico test range on the night of July the 15th, the men of the Manhattan Project would not get much sleep. Thunderstorms threatened to postpone the test. One scientist bet on the chances that the blast would ignite the atmosphere. He offered a side wager on whether it would destroy the entire world or only New Mexico. And then, just before dawn, at 5.29 on the morning of the 16th, the world changed forever. New Mexico sent a coded cable to Potsdam, operated on this morning. Results already exceed expectations. Dr. Groves, please. For President Truman at Potsdam, this was newfound power. James Burns called it the gun behind the door. There was now no longer a need for politically damaging concessions to the Japanese. And overnight, no more need for Stalin and his Red Army. Stalin doesn't know it, but I have an ace in the hole and another one showing. So unless he has three or two pair, and I know he does not, we are sitting all right. James Burns went to work immediately on the draft ultimatum to the Japanese. He took out warnings about the Russians and the bomb. And he erased the crucial language suggesting the possibility that Japan might keep its emperor. One gets a sense from these actions, interventions by Burns, and the uh, acquiescence in it by Truman, that they are of a mind, uh, agree, that as Burns put it at one point, as recorded in his aide's diary, that the point is to get the war over as soon as possible so that the Russians, the Soviet Union, don't get in so much on the kill of Japan. President Truman's diary raises the question of just how much he understood at the time. This weapon is to be used against Japan between now and August 10th. I have told the Secretary of War, Mr. Stimson, to use it so that military objectives and soldiers and sailors are the target, and not women and children. 
In fact, the target committee had made the decision to drop the bomb in the center of a city. Again, the president. Even if the Japs are savages, ruthless, merciless, and fanatic, we will issue a warning statement asking the Japs to surrender and save lives. I'm sure they will not do that, but we will have given them the chance. In fact, there would be no explicit warning about the bomb to the Japanese. And the Potsdam ultimatum would be issued the day after the military order to drop the bomb. This is one time in which I think Truman really needed an option paper and, and needed to call in his advisors who were knowledgeable about what the situation was in a war, what the situation was in Japan, and what the options were, including the atomic bomb and kind of say, okay, guys, you know, what should we do here? Here, here are, are the options. We can do this or we can not do this, but let's talk about this and weigh the options and to look beyond and see what's going to happen or what we think might happen as a result of, of using different options. Why did the, no one apparently sit down and say, why rush with this? Uh, do we want to reconsider this? Do we want to think about this again? Uh, I think I'd ask the question the other way around. That would have been the exceptional thing to do. I think the the truth of the matter is that the the notion that you have a uh, very powerful new weapon which can shorten the war is controlling and compelling. Looking behind that, they would say, Colonel Stimson, if he were here now, would be grabbing my elbow and reminding me that he had a committee that they had looked at the bomb, that the committee had recommended that it be used uh, against workers' dwellings, against the city. The matter had been thought through, and the notion that you hit fast, if you're going to hit, was already settled. And Harry Truman, an artillery captain too, felt the same way. I casually mentioned to Stalin that we had a new weapon of unusual destructive force. The Russian premier showed no special interest. Actually, Joseph Stalin knew about the American bomb long before Harry Truman. He had spies at Los Alamos in New Mexico. But he did not know the bomb would be dropped on Japan. And he would be stunned when he heard the news. President Truman was now in a hurry to leave Potsdam. According to James Burns' press aide, so he wouldn't have to tell Stalin why he hadn't kept his ally informed about the bomb. Once on board the USS Augusta, Burns' aide would add this. The president took Burns by the arm and said, come on, Jimmy, let's go below and have a drink. If these sons of bitches want to see me again, they will have to come to Washington. The bomb would be dropped on Hiroshima four days later. I think the moral ambiguities in the use of the bomb uh, come down to the question of uh, when we used it and when we needed it to save casualties. Why we used two bombs in August to prepare for an invasion in November, when they were the only two bombs we had. We assumed there'd be a third one in two weeks, and a fourth one two weeks after that, but we weren't really sure. And the fact that we use those two in such a hurry, I think, speaks to Burns's concerns about the Russians rather than Truman's concerns about the casualties. If proof were needed that the bomb had a momentum of its own, consider that even before the successful test of the plutonium bomb, the smaller uranium bomb, Little Boy, which scientists were certain would work without a test, had already left Los Alamos. Its voyage to Tinian Island, 1,500 miles from Japan, would take 10 days. The order to use the bomb was issued only as an afterthought, because the Air Force General in charge would not drop an atomic bomb without a written order. The 509th will deliver its first special bomb as soon as weather will permit visual bombing after about August 3rd, 1945 on one of the targets. Additional bombs will be delivered on the above targets as soon as made ready by the project staff. President Truman would later claim that he gave the order to drop the atomic bomb only after the Japanese rejected his Potsdam warning. The truth is that the order to drop the bomb was cabled from Potsdam the day before, and the president did not sign it. 
There's no reason to believe Truman ever saw that order. He would later say in his memoirs that he consulted with the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then had the order drawn up. There's no record at all that he ever met with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. So he may never even have seen the order. There's no indication that it was shown to Truman. It was not, his approval was not asked. The order is written by General Groves and signed by Colonel Stimson. In it, Groves gives himself full authority to use atomic bombs repeatedly as soon as they can be made ready. August the 4th. On Tinian Island, the crews chosen to fly the Enola Gay mission are briefed. No one mentions the words atomic bomb. Bob Caron, the tail gunner, would remember it this way. There were a lot of scientists with us. They had some movie film, but the projector broke down. But they had some slides. We knew it was going to be something big. We saw pictures of the test explosion at Trinity site in Alamogordo. It was just still pictures and slides, but it was breathtaking. The only way you could think of it was, what the hell is this? It was a question of saving hundreds of thousands of American lives. At 2.45 a.m., the Enola Gay cleared the runway on special bombing mission with 10,000 pounds of atomic bomb called Little Boy aboard. The mission pilot was Colonel Paul Tibbets. We got off at about 3 o'clock in the morning. We felt that it was our lucky day. We knew it was as we made the final approach toward Hiroshima, which the navigator hit right on the button. I could clearly see the city of Hiroshima within my bomb site. August the 6th, 1945, 8.15 a.m. There was an extraordinary flash, an eye-crushing flash. Then came the tremendous roar. I felt something strange on my face. Then I was shocked by the feeling that the skin on my face had come off, and the hands and the arms, too. It was now dark, like dusk. Everything was vague and hazy, as if a mist had covered my eyes. I wondered if I had lost my senses. At that moment, a kind of panic began to whirl up from somewhere in the crowd, as first one voice, then another began passing along a message. It's gasoline. The Americans are dumping gasoline on us. At least 75,000 people were killed instantly. The exact number of dead will never be clear because whole families, whole neighborhoods were wiped out by the bomb. No one knows precisely how many died from the effects of radiation in the months and years to come. The bomb had been detonated directly above its target, the center of the city. Two days later, more than one and a half million Red Army troops attacked the Japanese forces in China. Stalin rushed to get into the war before the new weapon could end it. The Japanese were no match for the Red Army. On Tinian, the plutonium bomb, Fat Man, was being made ready. The second atomic bombing had been scheduled for the 11th of August. But bad weather was forecast over Japan, and General Groves wanted to make sure that the plutonium bomb was field tested before the war was over. In Tokyo, the shock that Russia had entered the war forced military hardliners to begin talking surrender. They were still arguing on the morning of August the 9th. At 11.02 a.m., the second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. There might have been a moment when the bombing of Nagasaki could have been stopped, or at least delayed, but no second order from the president was needed to drop the second bomb. The first one had been dropped, the second one had been dropped. We knew we'd have another one in a couple of weeks, and before he heard 
the response of the Japanese about their surrender, he said, don't use that third bomb, I don't want to kill any more women and children. In that sense, Truman finally confronted the reality of the bomb. <laughs> On the 15th of August, the emperor broadcast a message to the Japanese people. They had never before heard his voice. He tells them Japan will surrender. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration, which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. In the end, President Truman did accept a conditional surrender. He just called it unconditional. Emperor Hirohito would remain ceremonial head of the Japanese nation until his death 44 years later. Finally, the war was over. Americans had fought and won a truly heroic victory. The story most of us know ends there. A few months after the war, in a public opinion poll, Almost 80% of the people endorsed dropping the bomb on Japanese cities. America had a nuclear monopoly. And even as new bombs were tested, debate over their use was limited. It would take a year after the war ended for the debate to sharpen. And then only when the entire issue of the New Yorker magazine was devoted to a report by John Hersey, entitled simply, Hiroshima. The article stunned Americans who'd known little about the bomb. It was broadcast nationwide on ABC Radio. He met hundreds and hundreds who were fleeing, and every one of them seemed to be hurt in some way. The eyebrows of some were burned off, and skin hung from their faces and hands. Some were vomiting as they walked. Many were naked or in shreds of clothing. Many, although injured themselves, supported relatives who were worse off. Almost all had their heads bowed, looked straight ahead, were silent, and showed no expression whatever. Hersey's words drew pictures of the bomb's victims that Americans still could not see. Films and photographs had been confiscated by the U.S. occupation forces. Images like these were censored then, and they were among the first to be removed from the Smithsonian this year, when its planned anniversary exhibit came under attack. In 1946, facing a rising tide of questions and criticism, the atomic decision makers would feel obliged to rewrite history. The president himself wrote to his ailing former secretary of war. There has been a great deal of conversation about how the conclusion was reached to drop the bomb. And there has been some indication that the decision was arrived at hurriedly and without consideration. I think you know the facts of the situation better than anybody, and I would like for you to straighten out the record on it. And so Colonel Stimson was recruited to lend his name and reputation to an article putting forth the official view of why the bomb was dropped. The article claimed the atomic decision was, quote, carefully considered, and offered little hint that Colonel Stimson at least was haunted by the civilian deaths. That article appeared in the February 1947 issue of Harper's Magazine, and was arguably the most significant magazine article to appear during the history of the Cold War, because it took what had been a growing debate um, over the decision to use the bomb on Japan, and really cut it short. The most enduring single fiction to grow out of the Harper's article was the notion most of us have long believed that one million American lives were saved by the bomb. There is no documentary evidence as to where the number came from. McGeorge Bundy, at 26, was the ghostwriter for the article that appeared in Colonel Stimson's name. If you read it carefully, what it says is, if the war goes on, to a point where we have to make the landings, I was informed that we could expect up to a million casualties, something like that, not deaths, casualties. So that's nothing but his picture of the worst that could happen if we can't get this war ended. It's not a claim that there would have been a million casualties. 
1952, in a letter which became part of the official Air Force history of the war, President Truman revised his estimates of American casualties upward until they too matched the one million first cited in the Harper's article. The casualty figures have always been a big part of the debate. Uh, so I think it's important to get the casualty figures right to begin with, but also to, to recognize that I think Truman would have used a bomb if it had been far fewer uh, casualties than he later uh, said it, it would have cost, but even far fewer than what his advisors were saying in the summer of 1945. I think if somebody said to Truman, Mr. President, you have a choice between dropping the bomb and saving, say, a thousand American lives, and Truman said, do it, drop the bomb. I mean, I'm not sure at what number Truman would have said, well, wait, let's stop and think about this now. Uh, but my guess is that it would have been a fairly small number. The generation that fought World War II sees the war as having two bookends, Pearl Harbor and Hiroshima. The viciousness of Pearl Harbor is all but satisfied by the viciousness for Hiroshima. The ambiguity is something we're really not prepared for. We've all lived in the shadow of the uh, mushroom cloud. We've all prepared through civil defense for some kind of a holocaust that luckily never occurred. So we know how awful this thing can be. But I think we've never confronted the fact that we alone and without a clear justification militarily decided to use this thing as quickly as we could on inhabited cities. For one thing, it is hard for people who didn't live through the war to understand how much it meant to the men who believe their lives were spared because it was dropped. At the same time, it is clear there are people who don't want to contemplate the moral questions that are also part of the bomb's legacy. It's unfortunate, we think, that some veterans organizations and some politicians felt the need to bully our most important national museum, so the whole story of Hiroshima is not represented here. That is not fair to history or to the rest of us. After all, freedom of discussion was one of the ideals that Americans fought and died for. I'm Peter Jennings. Good night. Jennings reporting. Call 1-800-913-3434. The price is $29.95 plus $4 shipping and handling. For a transcript, call 1-800-ALL-NEWS. This has been a special presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. The American Broadcasting Company. ABC beginning the proposal for the exhibit was under attack too many pictures of victims the critics said too much american guilt I, I can't believe that they would create such an abomination by the spring of 1994 some veterans groups had declared virtual war on the museum saying the exhibit portrayed americans as vengeful aggressors and the japanese as innocent victims it's certainly un-american that might be close to treason. The Smithsonian tried to incorporate the veterans' views, but the American Legion vowed to resist anything that questioned the moral and political wisdom involved in dropping the atomic bomb. The curators wrote a political statement, an anti-nuclear, anti-atomic political statement. Finally, the exhibit collapsed over a hypothetical question. How many American lives did the bomb really save? There are literally millions of Americans who would not be here today if those weapons had not been used. Many veterans insisted that by dropping the bomb, the U.S. avoided a ground invasion of the Japanese mainland. One million American lives, they argued, had been saved. But 
when the Smithsonian responded that such a claim had no historical basis, the vets went to Capitol Hill. 81 congressmen took up their cause. So after a bruising two-year battle, the Smithsonian bent to the... I made the only decision I ever knew how to make. I did what I thought was right. 50 years ago, the United States dropped the atomic bomb on Japan. To this day, Americans know very little about how that decision was reached. It's been justified ever since as something that saved American lives. The ambiguity is something we're really not prepared for. Tonight, a week before the bomb's anniversary, why it was dropped. Did it shorten the war? Did it save American lives? Was it necessary? Were there alternatives? Did the United States need to be the first and only nation to use an atomic bomb? Do Americans know the truth about the decision to drop the atomic bomb? Americans know very little about why the bomb was used. Peter Jennings reporting. Hiroshima, why the bomb was dropped. Two years ago, America's premier history museum, the Smithsonian, set out to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the flight of the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. We want to present, as best we can, multiple views of that history, not a singular view of uh, one or another or a third party. From the massive argument, the whole thing is terrifying. You must have spent many sleepless nights over it. A year less of war, Charlie, will mean life for 300,000, maybe a half a million, of America's finest youth. These were the decisive considerations in my consent. As President of the United States, sir, you could make no other decision. As President, I could not. In the film, there are many factual mistakes. The Enola Gay takes off on its historic mission and then braves heavy flak over Hiroshima. On August the 6th, 1945, there was no hostile fire. 250,000 people down there starting the day. A city about the size of Dallas, Texas. In about one second, they'll be wiped off the map. They'll never know what hit them. We've been dropping warning leaflets on them for 10 days now. That's 10 days more warning than they gave us at Pearl Harbor. In fact, no leaflets were dropped specifically warning the city below of a powerful new bomb. The film won the Academy Award for its special pressure and decided to present just the Alona Gay without commentary. There would be nothing on the decision to drop the bomb, and there would be no pictures of the victims. Good evening. I'm Peter Jennings. Tonight, we're going to revisit the decision to drop the atomic bomb on Japan. We're going to go behind the scenes of the Truman administration 50 years ago, as America struggled to finally end the bloody war in the Pacific. The site of the Enola Gay, newly refurbished and on exhibition here at the Smithsonian, is a shiny reminder that in the closing days of World War II, the United States, in its determination to end the war, became the first and only nation ever to use the atomic bomb. It was a subject of controversy then, as it is now. Hiroshima, why the bomb was dropped. Peter Jennings reporting. Ladies and gentlemen, the 33rd President of the United States, Harry S. Truman. In 1964, Harry Truman would cooperate with a television series that laid out the official well, history of his presidency. Good to see you here this morning for a discussion, I hope, of uh, some historical matters in which you ought to be interested. My goodness alive, young lady with the red hair right behind the school teacher there. Mr. President, why did you drop the atom bomb? Mr. President, the future wants to know, was it right to drop the atom bomb? My 
my chief purpose was to end the war in victory with the least possible loss of American lives. I never had any qualms about using an instrument that finally ended the war in which we either had 250 or 300,000 of our youngsters killed and 700,000 of them maimed. I made the only decision I ever knew how to make. I did what I thought was right. The official history of the atomic bomb was also reflected from movie screens. In fact, Hollywood's first attempt at an A-bomb blockbuster was not released until it had White House approval. In the original script, the actor playing President Truman made what seemed a quick and easy decision. It was American boys or the bomb. But the president's advisors who previewed the film were concerned about his image. And the president himself wrote to the man who portrayed him. My only objection is it appeared to have been a snap judgment program. It was made to appear as if no consideration had been given to the result of dropping the bomb. That is an absolutely wrong impression. Thank God we've got the bomb and not the Japanese. What movie audiences finally saw was an agonized decision. That's one argument for our using it, Charlie, but it's not the decisive.